Julia received her Bachelor of Science from Queen's University in Chemistry. When she completed her bachelor, she went on to get her um, doctorate degree at the University of British Columbia. She worked in Ray Anderson's lab, and her research at that point was focused on the origin of secondary metabolites. Upon her completion of her PhD, she went and took a postdoc at um, Scripps Institute of Oceanography. At this point, she was working in Bill Fenicol's laboratory, and she shifted her focus from origin of secondary metabolites to the way organisms can use chemicals to assess their environment and went into chemical ecology. She continued these studies with another postdoc in Dan Baden's lab at the University of North Carolina in Wilmington, um, focusing a lot at this point on neurotoxins uh, found but that are produced by um, marine phytoplankton. She joined the faculty here at Georgia Tech in 1991 and or 2001, depending on... Oh, 2001, yes. <laughs> Please, excuse me, wrong number. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we're adding an extra 10 years to her career. Um, yeah, so since the beginning of her career, which actually started back with her bachelor's, Julia has over 75 publications in peer-reviewed journals. Um, she has a couple of patents, and she's actually had quite a few awards, and a couple of those include the presidential... Mm, just a moment, it's a long one. The Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. Um, she also got the Georgia Tech Faculty Woman Distinction Award. And this year, she's getting the Silverstein Simone Lecture Award from the International Society of Chemical Ecology. This award actually recognizes outstanding achievement or contribution to the frontiers of chemical ecology. This morning, she's gonna discuss um, chemical cues in the environment, um, specifically antimicrobial chemical cues, and um, their future in drug discovery. Thanks a lot, Margie. One quick word before Dr. Kuhn starts. Um, we had a misunderstanding about the Georgia Tech Faculty Award. Um, it's actually the Georgia Tech All right, I hope that the restlessness won't be too much for you with the lack of the breakfast. Um, I really appreciate everybody coming out on what I usually judge to be the best day of the year. Grades were entered yesterday. The whole summer is ahead of us. It's all downhill from here. So um, I appreciate you coming so early on a Tuesday morning. And I'm going to talk about some research going on in our lab right now. And I'm going to try to, I'm choosing the more biomedical aspects because of the interests of IBB and this particular audience. But I wanted to point out um, uh, some resources that exist on campus and some interactions that are going on among faculty and students. And one of those is a center that we established about two years ago that's, we're still building it up. There's not too, too much going on yet to get really excited about, but we have this Aquatic Chemical Ecology Center with about 20 faculty members and their associated students. And our major activity these days is to run an NSF REU program for undergraduate internship in research. And every summer we bring in a group of undergraduates from around the country. We have about 20 faculty involved in mentoring them in various aspects of research um, connected uh, to aquatic chemical ecology. And that involves research groups in the schools of biology, chemistry and biochemistry, chemical and biomolecular engineering, uh, civil and environmental engineering, uh, physics. So we've got quite a broad group of faculty and students involved in that program. My own research group, we have our own uh, lab web page. So right now we number about 10 people total, plus a handful of undergraduates. And we focus on two major areas of investigation. And one of those uh, is, uh, well, the, the theme that embraces all of this area is interactions between organisms based on chemistry. Um, and we sort of divide these into two major categories. One is the chemical ecology of nearshore reefs. So that involves shallow water habitats that include tropical habitats like coral reefs. Um, and then the chemical ecology of the marine plankton. This is the open ocean where most of the, the critters that we're involved in are microscopic, um, microscopic phytoplankton and the animals, the microscopic animals that graze on those. And so here highlighted in yellow are some of the kinds of projects that are ongoing in the lab right now. And today I'm going to focus on some projects down on this side of, 
of the diagram, um, we're going to be, I'm going to talk to you, start off with a story about surface mediated defenses against pathogens and competitors, and then how we can co-opt uh, what we learn about the chemically mediated interactions involving pathogens um, to study um, drug discovery and molecular targets. So that's, that's what we're going to hear about today. <coughs> So this is a little bit of a, a different point of view than you might come about as a typical biomedical researcher. So I'd like to tell you a little bit of a story about what uh, is going on right now in the oceans of the world. Some of this you might know from, from your own interests in, in the natural world and some of this might be something that you wonder about but don't have a lot of hard information on. And one thing that you might um, be aware of is that coral reefs are under extreme threats worldwide. And there are many, many causes for the degradation of coral reefs. Um, they include overfishing, which removes uh, the herbivorous fish from reefs. And when you remove the herbivorous fish, you end up with too much seaweed, and the seaweed smother the corals. It includes also eutrophication, so that's over input of nutrients in coastal waters, where there is a lot of uh, human habitation. Also, erosion caused by human habitation in coastal waters. Uh, erosion causes uh, sedimentation in nearshore waters that effectively choke out corals and choke out photosynthetic organisms, block their light. Uh, we also have uh, problems that coral reefs face that are associated with climate change. And those include uh, predicted changes that will occur probably over the next few decades involving ocean acidification which affects the carbonate skeleton uh, laying down abilities of many marine organisms, including hard corals, and also the rise in sea levels. And then uh, the association that is becoming evident between diseases in coral reefs and rising sea surface temperatures. So there are many different kinds of diseases that afflict marine organisms, and some of these directly affect corals and cause diseases like this black band disease. Uh, this is a fungal disease that affects gorgonian corals, but also plants can be afflicted with diseases, and essentially there are just a huge number of microorganisms out there in the ocean just waiting to do damage to marine organisms. If you think about when you yourself go swimming and if you have a cut on your leg, how easy it is for that to become infected. There's just a lot of pathogens out there, and the marine organisms that exist in this soup of bacteria, fungi, and viruses have to find ways to avoid becoming constantly infected. And so we have taken an approach of wondering how marine organisms solve this fundamental problem based on their ecology, and the hypothesis we posed is that they use antimicrobial chemical defenses to prevent themselves from becoming infected by pathogens. So today I'm going to focus on the diseases that affect seaweeds and the chemistry of seaweeds that can fight those diseases. Um, but other marine organisms also suffer from, from microbial diseases. And so we know that there are about a million bacterial cells per milliliter of seawater, about a, a thousand fungal cells per milliliter of seawater. And some of these uh, microorganisms are pathogenic. Some of them cause specific diseases to certain hosts, so they're specialists in their host choice, but others are generalists. So some of these microbes are ca capable of infecting many different potential hosts, including sometimes many potential different algal or seaweed hosts. So given the situation that seaweeds exist under, why aren't all seaweeds equally susceptible to disease? And we suspect that there ought to be some very interesting chemistry in these plants that would protect them against disease. And so this is not a, a completely original notion. There's quite a strong literature on marine organisms using chemistry to protect themselves from their natural enemies. But in a lot of cases, what we know about these natural enemies is what we know about our predators as natural enemies. So what I'm showing you here are a selection of, of uh, compounds um, that are used at now as medicines and that are uh, produced by marine organisms um, for their own protection as part of this ecological strategy. So on the top left here, we have a molecule whose total name is cut off, I'm sorry, ET743, ectinacidin. This is uh, a natural product that's found in the tissues of a sea squirt. It's actually produced by a bacterium that's symbiotic with that sea squirt. Uh, it protects the sea squirt from predation by fish, and it's used um, now, it's approved as a, a treatment for soft tissue sarcoma, so it's actually an anti-cancer agent. Okay. There's also um, peptide natural products produced by these cone snails in their venom glands. So this is the amino acid sequence of the backbone with the disulfide bridges. So this molecule here is produced by Pfizer as a pain medication, so what kills you at high doses can be helpful to you at low doses. This particular molecule um, affects calcium channels and it's used by the cone snail when it attacks um, 
a fish prey, it actually inserts its barb with the venom into the fish prey, waits for the fish to be subdued, and then slowly envelops it and eats it. Okay, but that same peptide can be really dangerous if you decide to take that snail and tuck it into your shirt when you're collecting on the beach because that's a very potent toxin. Um, this is a different kind of peptide, a cyclic peptide that's connected by an ester bond, a common motif in what we call secondary metabolites. As when Margie introduced me, she mentioned that I've worked on secondary metabolites. These are the unusual molecules made by lots and lots of living organisms that are not typically ribosomally, ribosomally encoded. So this kind of cyclic peptide is made by an enzyme complex. Uh, it's found in the sea slug. Uh, it's also found in the green alga that the sea slug feeds on. Uh, and it protects that sea slug against predators. And then finally, I'm showing you an example here of this bryostatin, which is also now in clinical trials for cancer. It's made, or it's found in the tissues of this marine invertebrate, um, and again, it's an anti-predator chemical defense. So there's lots and lots of examples of chemical defenses in marine organisms that function against predators. Some of these have been co-opted by scientists to use as medicines, um, but not so much has been known about uh, their protection, the value of these uh, molecules in protecting marine organisms against their own um, diseases. So the research that we're doing in my lab is part of a cooperative um, program that's funded through the NIH. It's been funded here at Georgia Tech since 2004. Uh, there are three research groups at Georgia Tech that are part of this program, actually four research groups if we include the one also in international affairs. We do not only drug discovery and uh, coral reef conservation and chemical ecology, we also work on some economic development uh, projects, one including the Georgia Aquarium where they're uh, using some of the uh, what we call live rock, which is a substrate that's used in the aquarium industry. We've been working with the Fijian villages to try to build up their capacity in producing artificial live rock that's cultured on the reef instead of people harvesting and just crowbarring off uh, pieces of reef to sell. So the project has lots of different angles to it, but in my lab, really what we focus on is the drug discovery and the chemical ecology side. So we've been collecting hundreds and hundreds of organisms from Fiji, which is our host country for doing this project, since 2004. I think we're up to a collection now of about 5,000 extracts of marine organisms. And we screen these extracts for various different qualities. And then we narrow in on certain uh, individual collections and try to understand their chemistry a bit better and explore them. And I'm showing you this example, and this is going to form the basis for today's uh, research story. It's a red alga um, that is from a family here that starts with an S, Soliolaraceae. Um, this is a fairly understudied uh, group of algae when it comes to their chemistry. At the time we initiated this project, there were about seven molecules known from the entire family of algae to which this one species belongs, and none of that chemistry was very interesting. So the structures were pretty uh, plain and the biological activities were pretty uh, minor. Um, but what we noticed when we collected this organism in the field was that it was periodically abundant in certain areas and very, very clean. So its surfaces um, failed to have necrotic patches uh, or failed to be fouled by other organisms. This suggests that there might be some underlying chemical basis for the cleanness um, of, the, of the tissues. And so when we uh, extracted those tissues and we measured them in an antifungal assay using a marine fungal pathogen that's known to infect several different species of marine algae, we found that this extract had really potent antifungal activity against this generalist fungal pathogen, Lindrethalaceae. So the, some of this work was initiated at the University of the South Pacific in Fiji. We brought these extracts back to the lab here at Georgia Tech and we've been studying their chemistry and their <coughs> biology ever since. And so here what I'm showing you is a typical um, HPLC chromatogram. So along the x-axis here we have time. Every peak, this is a UV absorption um, chromatogram, and so every peak here really uh, represents one or maybe even a few compounds found in the extract of this alga. So we're talking about a minimum of hundreds of different uh, unique chemical entities here. And so we're not interested in describing the chemistry from scratch and just um, identifying all the structures of hundreds of molecules just as if that they had no purpose. What we really want to do is understand the structures of molecules that matter. And so we couple the fractionation of these extracts using HPLC with a biological assay to determine which compounds we want to study further. And so what you see here in the bar graph is a tall black bar means lots of antifungal activity. And so you see there's 
antifungal activity in almost all of the fractions from this HPLC chromatogram. This means that the, um, the potential for this, for this alga to be defending itself from fungal pathogens is really, really high. And we've been identifying some of the molecules from this extract, starting with the most abundant and the most potent ones, and eventually going to the ones that are found at lower concentrations and are less potent. Okay. Is that reverse phase? That is reverse phase chromatography, yes. So at this point um, in time, we've now identified 33 molecules from this, um, gr this alga. And here I'm showing you the first two structures we solved. And we really actually solved these with X-ray crystallography in collaboration uh, with Emory University. Ken Hardcastle solved the X-ray crystal structure for us. But usually we depend heavily on NMR spectroscopy because we almost never have enough of these compounds to get them to crystallize and to analyze their X-ray crystal structures. Typically, we isolate these molecules somewhere between 100 micrograms and a couple of milligrams. And uh, 100 micrograms is kind of the lower end that we can solve structures for these kinds of molecules at Georgia Tech. And we have to fight really hard with the data to solve the structure of a molecule for which we only have 100 micrograms. Um, we can go to UGA and use their NMR spectrometers um, in order to solve structure of molecules down to 10 or 20 micrograms. Um, and we've been working to try to get that kind of instrumentation at Georgia Tech. So we need a higher field NMR spectrometer and we need a cryoprobe coupled with it in order to do that kind of work. So um, the NMR is really, really crucial for solving the vast majority of our compounds. So I'm showing you here um, about 10 molecules whose structures we've solved from this alga that all have slight variations on a common theme. And so what you're seeing here are macrocyclic lactones. Macrocyclic lactones are really common in nature, but are more commonly found um, or co more commonly produced by a pathway called the polyketide pathway than they are produced by this pathway called the isoprenoid or terpene pathway. So the green part of the molecule here, the 20 carbons that are circled in green, um, comes from the isoprenoid or terpene pathway. This is a pathway that's common to microorganisms, plants, and even animals. It's essentially the pathway that leads to cholesterol in humans. Um, and it's a pathway that involves the uh, condensation of five carbon units. So isoprenoids tend to be clumped in gr groups of carbons of five. So here we have four clumps of five to give us this isoprenoid backbone. And then what's interesting about this lactone is that it's cyclized with what I'm circling in purple here, the shikimate portion. Um, and that, that causes the molecule to have a carbon skeleton that's not been previously seen in nature before. So this, these molecules belong to a structural class that we identified that are not known from any other kinds of organisms um, in the world. And with the different variations on the theme that we're seeing, what we think that represents is that the enzymes that the alga is using to assemble these different molecules um, are somewhat sloppy in their ability to do certain transformations. And so they vary somewhat in the extent of bromination and hydroxylation. They vary somewhat in the placement of these double bonds. And in this case, this molecule here even varies in the way that the ring has been cyclized. So we probably have, showing you these 10 molecules here, two major cyclization enzyme systems, one that makes these nine compounds and one that makes this compound. But then there are some other enzymes that are responsible for the halogenation that are um, known to occur in rat algae, um, but in this case are bringing together uh, the halogenation and the hydroxylation with a pretty interesting framework for these molecules. Now when we contrast the natural abundance of these molecules with um, their potency, we see that some of the molecules are more important for the chemical defense than others. So I'm afraid that the y-axis label has been cut off here. And what you're seeing is um, natural concentration in micromolar, I believe. And um, in the, so the black bar is the natural concentration of the individual molecules shown here. And the orange diamond is the IC50 against the pathogenic marine fungus. So whenever the black bar size exceeds the orange diamond, that means the alga has way more of the compound than its IC50. The IC50 is the concentration uh, required of the compound to kill 50% of fungus. So basically, if you have more of the compound than needed to kill about 50%, you've got a pretty potent antifungal defense. So most of these molecules are pretty effective at their natural concentrations in the alga. Um, but some of them are more potent than others. So these variations, these small variations in structure uh, result in, in some significant differences in potency. Now when we went to explore this alga further and we went back to Fiji and made additional collections, even sometimes collections from a single site, but there were uh, individual plants that were found, say, one meter apart on the reef, 
we found that there was some differences at the chemical level that at first we did not recognize had a genetic basis. It wasn't until we um, segregated those collections and started examining them individually, we realized that we'd uncovered some genetic variation. So this was the, um, the group of molecules, the promophycoli class of molecules that we initially discovered. Um, but when we made these collections of this other um, alga that to us initially looked identical, we found a second group of compounds that differed somewhat. So what you'll see if you look carefully at this backbone is that we have the same 20 carbons of the isoprenoid pathway, but instead of being cyclized in a lactone, um, they have made small rings here, and we've been left with the carboxylic acid of the aromatic um, of the benzoate. And so that's a fundamentally different form of the molecule. And when we looked at these individual collections that had this, these group of compounds, we never found the other group of compounds and vice versa. When we looked at this group of collections that had the bromophycolides, we never found the calophycoic acids. So at that point, we hypothesized that we had some genetic variation. Um, and we thought that it was probably genetic because we would sometimes find these two types of algae even right next to each other on the reef. So environmental factors didn't really account for the differences in chemistry. And sure enough, when Tanya Shearer, who's in uh, the Snell lab at Georgia Tech, analyzed the 18S ribosomal RNA gene um, for these different collections, she found that there was a significant difference and that they clustered um, consistently, whereby the samples that were collected that had the chylophycoic acids um, grouped together. Within a, a thousand base pair stretch of the gene, there was about a 13 base pair variation in the sequence. So at the time, we actually thought that this likely um, reflected two different populations, potentially, um, or two different genotypes, but we thought it was they were the same species. Later on, when we uh, collaborated with an algal uh, taxonomist named Jerry Kraft in Australia, who's an expert in these types of algae, he actually suggested that these represent two different species, and this has later been renamed Calophycus densus. So they're members of the same genus, but not members of the same species. And at the genetic level, they differ not only um, with the kinds of genes you'd expect them to differ, like 18S ribosomal RNA, but they also differ in their secondary metabolism collection. Despite these differences in chemistry of these two very closely related species, and the fact that overall the bromophycolides are more potently antifungal than the calophycoic acids, so it seems like something about having a macrocyclic lactone makes a better antifungal weapon than having this kind of carboxylic acid motif. Despite these differences in structure and the differences in biological activity, both species have plenty of their natural products to defend themselves against the fungus. So on the y-axis here, we have percent growth inhibition of the pathogenic fungus. So essentially, their natural concentrations for both groups of compounds, for both species, are well above the IC50. So it seems like, from the algas point of view, it doesn't make too much difference which of these groups of compounds are present. They got plenty of it. Now, this left us with a little bit of a curiosity about what goes on at the microscopic scale for organisms like algae. So what we've been measuring here in terms of these natural concentrations um, and the IC50 values, we've been looking at whole tissue concentrations of the compounds. Now, when a fungal pathogen comes from the water column and colonizes the surface of an alga, it doesn't immediately encounter necessarily an equivalent concentration of antifungal chemistry that's got anything to do with the whole tissue concentration. The surface concentration ought to matter a lot. So from the point of view of the alga and the fungus, we wondered whether or not these compounds really were effective at preventing surface colonization or if they're only affected at effective at protecting the bulk tissue once a fungus penetrated the surface of the alga. And in order to answer that question, we really needed to be able to look at the surface distribution of these molecules and the surface concentrations of these molecules on the alga. From an ecological point of view, that matters a lot more than the bulk concentration. So for this, we asked Facundo Fernandez if we could work together because Facundo's lab here at Georgia Tech um, develops uh, mass spectrometric tools for asking questions of all kinds. And this uh, technology that's um, been present in Facundo's lab for several years now is one that they initially developed in order to study uh, counterfeit malaria tablets that are being circulated throughout Southeast Asia. And Facundo's lab had a, had a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to, ex to use this kind of technology to take a tablet, a medicine tablet, put it under the beam of the mass spectrometer, and determine whether or not that medicine was fake 
or whether it was authentic. And if it was authentic, how high quality was it? Well, this same kind of technology can be used to study the surface chemistry of biological samples, not just of inert um, materials like tablets. So essentially what we do is we take a piece of alga. This can be live or it can be preserved. Um, we put it on the sample stage here. Uh, there is a source that delivers charged solvent um, through tubing here to the surface of the alga. Um, it allows charge to be transferred over to molecules that are able to accept that charge. Charged molecules then become basically sucked into the mass spectrometer inlet and analyzed like in traditional mass spectrometry. But this is done at ambient pressure, ambient temperature, and so you can work even with live samples. And what for most important for us, what we found was that after a gentle treatment with this technology, we don't see any evidence of cell lysis on the surface of the alga, which means that any chemistry we see very likely is actual surface chemistry as opposed to um, caused by the damage of uh, um, if the technology was damaging. So when we first studied the surface chemistry with Facundo's students, um, we found that for the most part, when we looked at a typical algal sample, um, we just saw noise. So this indicates that there's not too much surface chemistry that we could, we could um, catch um, in most parts of the alga. But then about maybe covering 5 to 10 percent of the algal surface, we'd see these little clumps. And these little clumps, a uh, student in my lab, Amy Lane, examined them, um, stained them with various uh, reagents to look for what kinds of organisms might be found in these clumps. And there was some cellular debris in these clumps, but there wasn't evidence of, of live organisms living here. What this really looked like was that it was a little clump of coral-based sand that had accreted inorganic material that was stuck to the surface of the alga. Okay. Now, what we know about the inner tissues of algae is if you were to nick them with a razor blade, okay, there is a certain amount of carbohydrate matrix, goo, that oozes out through that cut. And if that was to happen to a live plant in the water, then little bits of sand from wave action are going to stick to that little wound and create what really looks like a little clump of sand stuck just on the algal surface. And when we aimed the mass spectrometer beam at these little clumps on the surface, we saw mass ions that were highly indicative of bromophycolides. And so in fact, these masses all correspond to either uh, chlor chlorine adducts um, or um, debrominated versions of the bromophycolides, especially the two dominant bromophycolides that we had previously identified. So they seem, these molecules seem to be present on the surface of the alga, but only associated with these little clumps of inorganic material. And when we mapped the distribution of compounds throughout the algal surface, we consistently found hot spots of these molecules associated with these little clumps of, of inorganic sand. And we didn't see very much bromophycolite elsewhere on the algal surface. So our working hypothesis right now is that, in fact, these little areas where the sand has stuck um, overlay a wound site on the plant. Now, this wound could have been caused by any number of things. Abrasion, wave action, could have been caused by a small animal chewing on the blade, or it could even be caused by microbes penetrating the tissue. But the area where we collect our algae, there's high wave action. These are shallow waters near shore. There's lots of opportunity for physical damage. And those sites of physical damage would also be vulnerable sites where the fungi could get into the tissue if they weren't otherwise protected with these antifungal defenses. So it looks like at these same sites where we have damage that has occurred, we've got a nice sort of medicine lace band-aid protecting the alga from fungal invasion. Now, moving into the biomedical aspect of this, um, these same molecules, bromophycolides A um, and on down the list, we screen them for various different uh, biological activities to look at them as potential pharmaceuticals. And so these include um, some bacteria that are, are uh, dangerous, um, in, especially in hospital-acquired infections, as well as tuberculosis. Um, Various stra uh, strains of cancer, this, this represents the average of 11 cancer cell lines for which these compounds were screened, um, HIV as well. And really the most interesting biological activity seemed to be on the side of the malaria activity, specifically bromophycolides A and D, shown here, had some pretty decent anti-malarial activity. We would like this activity to have been down in the low nanomolar range, but high nanomolar range is certainly worth exploring. And with a combination of a medicinal chemistry program, we can optimize that kind of biological activity to enhance its potency even more. So we decided to pursue this a little bit further. Um, and as many of you know, malaria is a disease of, of huge consequence uh, to humans around the world. Um, around a million deaths a year, those numbers are somewhat contested, but uh, 
very devastating disease and as you probably also have heard um, there is rapid evolution of resistance by the parasite that causes malaria and so there are fewer and fewer drug options and right now um, the best uh, line of treatment which involves the artemisinin class of compounds that are used in combination therapies with other medicines. Uh, there's even uh, resistance that has been detected now uh, over the last three years on the Thai Cambodian border to the artemisinin class of compounds. So none of the class of antimalarials that are in existence right now are free of, of resistance um, when you look at the different regions of the world and we really need new structural classes to target this very devastating disease. Um, and there's a very strong history of natural products being important as antimalarial agents. So you might know about the quinine uh, um, antimalarials that include the synthetic derivatives, chloroquine and mefloquine. Um, these molecules were originally discovered uh, from a South American tree. Um, and then the artemisinin class of molecules that are so important right now, these are uh, produced by a native Chinese plant and in fact the artemisinin that's on the market is largely um, available to us as based on farming of this plant. There's really uh, interesting research going on um, and in fact uh, by people who visited Georgia Tech in the last few years about trying to genetically engineer yeast and bacteria to produce this class of molecules because these are natural products that are encoded um, in, they're produced by enzymes that are genetically encoded. So if, if these genes can be moved into more culturable organisms than something like the Chinese wormwood plant, then that would allow for a better source of artemisinins. So um, there's a very rich history of natural products as being crucial for, for the treatment of malaria, and so we hoped to um, use that as a springboard to take our molecules forward. So what we did at this point now, and this is um, the Amy, the student in my lab who is working on the chemical ecology, um, she graduated and went off for her postdoc. And then um, Paige Stout, who is in my lab uh, as a PhD student in the chemistry and biochemistry program, was interested in biomedical drug discovery, so she tackled this problem. And what we learned from comparing the uh, antimalarial activity of the naturally occurring compounds, of which we'd isolated um, a few dozen, as I mentioned, with some semi-synthetic analogs that Paige was able to make in the lab, was that there were um, various lessons to be learned here that would allow us um, to predict which kinds of molecules would be most active and also predict then how we could synthetically modify these molecules either towards increasing potency, which is a very big challenge, or towards changing other uh, features of natural products that are important to make them drug worthy. That includes solubility, metabolism, and um, in this particular case, Paige's goal was to design a probe that could be used to better understand the mode of action of this compound against malaria. And so what we found was that um, we could, we could change the hydroxyl group here, the phenolic group uh, on the aromatic system to an ester-linked group without actually losing biological activity. In fact, we enhanced biological activity a little bit when we changed this hydroxyl group to an acetyl group, and that gave us the hint that maybe we could attach a linker through that group to put a fluorescent probe or an antibody binding probe on there and then use that probe towards understanding mode of action. So that's what we did um, at this point was modify this side group group. And we did that using some fairly traditional chemistry. So cut off here on the edge is just the parent molecule with the hydroxyl group. It has okay anti-malarial activity. The bromophycolide probe we made has slightly enhanced activity. That's good because when you're working with this kind of um, chemical biology challenge of visualizing natural <coughs> products in their natural, in their um, binding site, you don't want, if, if your probe has lost activity, then you can't really use it. It means it's probably not gonna go hit your target. So we have a, a nice active probe here. The the beauty of this kind of coumarin-based probe is that it's both fluorescent itself, so we can use it in uh, visualization experiments, and we have access to a monoclonal antibody to, that recognizes this part of the molecule, so we can use it for affinity uh, experiments to try to pull down protein targets. Now, working with a malaria group at UC Riverside, so what they do is that they culture the malaria parasite in human red blood cells and Paige went over to work in their lab and she took our fluorescent probe and she incubated it um, with live red blood cells that were infected with the malaria parasite. Now about 6% of the red blood cells are infected at any given time. You can recognize the infected ones by these black dots that I will tell you a little bit more about in a minute. So these red circles indicate um, the red, human red blood cells that are infected with the malaria parasite. 
the ones that are, look nice and perfect, spherical, and uh, don't have the little black dot are the ones that have not yet been infected. And you can see when we've incubated our compound with these uh, red blood cells for a period of a few hours, we end up seeing all of the fluorescent accumulating in the infected red blood cells. So that's a really positive thing. That's a good starting place, indicating that the drug is probably going in and out of all of these cells, but it's um, sticking around in the infected red blood cells. And so um, that means that it's going in the right direction. These two other um, sets of experiments here are negative controls to make sure that uh, the, the probe itself wasn't responsible for this effect, that it was the bromophycolide portion of the molecule that finds the target in the parasite and it drags that fluorescent part along. The drug is primarily um, soluble in no, it's pretty poorly soluble in water. So um, the drug, so bromophycolide and its probe are soluble in DMSO, which is the vehicle that we usually use to administer in experiments like this. Once you get it into an aqueous system, it's very lipophilic, so it'll, it's very permeable. So that's one nice feature, so it'll go through the cell membrane and accumulate in cells. Um, it can um, it can permeate cell membranes just by passive diffusion. It doesn't need any kind of active transport, but its solubility in aqueous solution is pretty poor. And I'll show you some data at the end that suggests that that's a problem. Yeah. Uh, one of the challenge, the perpetual challenges of drug discovery is balancing out that act between solubility and permeability. And uh, these kinds of molecules do suffer from those difficulties. So then when we used, um, these are fixed, um, human red blood cells that have been previously infected with a malaria parasite. Well, so they're fixed in the images, but before we fixed the cells, we incubated with the probe. Um, our probe is this green down here. Um, what we're seeing here are uh, human uh, red blood cells that are infected either with early stage or late stage, so more uh, predominantly infected. What you see with the DAPI image is DNA, right? So that, of course, indicates the nucleus of the parasite because red blood cells don't themselves have a nucleus. So um, everywhere you see DAPI staining is indicative of malaria infection. Um, our probe seems to be co-localizing with some of the DNA or with some of the malaria parasites. But in fact, the best co-localization was with, between our probe and this stain called Nile Red. And st Nile Red is known to stain intracellular neutral lipids. Um, and this is a, a important for the malaria parasite because the parasite has to deal with a challenge in its life history that not a lot of uh, protozoan parasites have to deal with. And that is the challenge of dealing with heme. So uh, malaria, when it infects a red blood cell, it needs to eat something. And hemoglobin is really, really abundant in red blood cells. And so it's going to make a meal out of that hemoglobin. It degrades the peptides. It utilizes those amino acids um, for its own purposes. But it's left with heme. And heme is not a particularly nice thing to have around at really high concentration. And once you've eaten all that hemoglobin, there's a lot of heme left over. So what the parasite actually does is it tries to take the heme molecules, which are toxic to it, and basically get them out of the way. And it puts them in these neutral lipid bodies. So these are um, vacuoles, essentially, that have very little protein material in them, um, but are a great environment for stacking up heme in a non-enzymatic uh, process that results in what's called hemozoan, or a somewhat of a crystallized form of heme. And when I mentioned earlier that the human red blood cells um, that were infected with malaria had those black dots, that's what you're seeing is the hemozoan, are those black dots. Okay. And so what this means is that our bromophycolite compound is localizing to the part of the parasite where it's dealing with toxic heme. So it seems like our best hypothesis was that our parasite was interfering with this non-enzymatic detox pathway that the malaria parasite needs to use in order to get rid of bad heme and turn it into harmless hemozoan. Um, this is a pathway that is known to be used by some other malaria drugs. So the quinine antimalarials also are heme crystallization inhibitors, and that is their major function or their major way that they kill the malaria parasite. So even though our molecule, bromophycolide, differs greatly in its molecular structure from the quinine class of antimalarials, it seems to be operating by a very similar mechanism. Now, we haven't been able to uh, crocrystallize our compound with heme to show how it's interacting but we, do, um, we did use a number of UV-Vis spectroscopy experiments and some circular dichroism experiments to study the, in vitro the direct interaction between bromophycolide and heme. And it does seem that uh, bromophycolides is uh, interacting with heme and cr causing a, creating a complex um, that 
is consistent with its role as a heme crystallization inhibitor. So basically when the parasite wants to take these heme molecules and stack them up like dinner plates and turn them into hemozoan, bromophycolites get in the way. And when bromophycolites get in the way of that, then you're left with heme, it's not hemozoan, it's free heme, and it's still toxic. And then the ma malaria parasite dies. Is it fluoresce? So, the heme stacks, do they fluoresce? Um, I don't believe so, but I don't know for sure. Um, there's also an in vitro assay that we can use to, to measure the interaction between heme and bromophycolides, and it's a, it's a crystallization assay you can do under some pretty um, crazy um, in vitro conditions that involve very, very strong basic and high salt concentrations. Um, so not a really good mimic of what actually goes on inside the cell, um, but nevertheless a direct mechanism of measuring whether or not a given compound like bromophycolide A can actually inhibit the crystallization of heme. And what we see is that, in fact, yes, the, this absorbance here would be the absorbance of heme itself. And so what we're seeing is that if we increase the concentration of bromophycolide um, or the um, acetyl derivative, no, sorry, this acetyl derivative of bromophycolide, um, we get this kind of um, titration curve essentially where we're left with free heme that has a high absorbance at 405 nanometers and less hemozoan um, because these compounds are inhibiting the crystallization of heme. Okay, whereas the methyl ether derivative that has no antimolarial activity also does not cause this kind of effect on heme crystallization. So we have some pretty correlative but strong evidence that that is how bromophycolides are, are functioning. Um, despite the fact that our mode of action is not a novel one, it is a promising one um, because we have uh, efficacy of our molecule uh, even against drug resistant strains. So chloroquine and the quinine antimalarials um, have elicited uh, resistance on the part of the malaria parasite, um, but that is because of an efflux pump that the parasite uses to get rid of the quinine antimalarials. Our molecules, even though they bind with heme in a similar way to the quinine antimalarials do, they are structurally very, very different, and so they're not recognized by this export mechanism that the parasite uses to dump the quinine antimalarials. And as a result, we have efficacy even against the chloroquine resistant strains. So that's fairly promising um, that there isn't evidence that um, the strains that would be resistant to chloroquine would also be resistant to our compounds. Now, the other great thing about this probe was the fact not only is it fluorescent and we can use it as a visualization tool, but as I mentioned that, that we have access to an antibody that recognizes it and we can use it to try to pull down if there are any proteins to which bromophycolite is binding as an alternative mechanism of action in addition to the heme interaction. Um, we've done this experiment several times. We designed uh, two different sets of probes with different lengths of linker. We did, um, I'd say, we did this experiment probably upwards of six or seven times, and we never identified any proteins that bromophycolides seem to be interacting with. That doesn't mean there are no proteins that it's interacting with. It just means that we have not yet been able to identify them, and the heme binding activity remains our best candidate for the mechanism of action of the bromophycolides. Now, in order to take this molecule forward as a drug, we have several challenges. Um, one includes the solubility issue, as was mentioned. Um, there is the fact that the potency is not really as strong as we would want, so artemisinin is a more potent antimalarial. And in order to take um, drug molecules for, forward towards human clinical trials, we need to have some stepping stones here, and one of the typical stepping stones is to work with mice. So there is a mouse model for malaria. It's a, a plasmodial strain of the parasite that infects mice, so it's a different species than the one that infects humans, but it's very closely related, and it's typically used when um, studying the preliminary in vivo experiments that people would want to do with drugs. And so so first of all, we could see that in order to um, uh, see how our drug is handled by a living organism, we did some pharmacokinetics experiments. And what we're seeing here is that when we uh, dose the mouse either intra, uh, intravenously or intraperitoneally with bromophycolide A, um, we have a pretty rapid loss of the compound from the bloodstream. So this could be due to it crashing out of solution, it could be due to it being metabolized. Um, 
And in the end, or it could be due that it's, it's actually not chemically stable um, at that temperature, for instance. We did some experiments in the lab. Actually, Margie did these experiments and found that the compound is stable. It's not very soluble, but it's soluble enough to stay in blood for many, many hours. Um, so really, our problem was very likely to be metabolism. And so Margie went forward with experiments that she used human uh, liver enzymes that you can buy commercially. Um, and we incubated bromophycolides um, in vitro with these enzymes, and we saw pretty strong loss over a period of 24 hours of bromophycolides in these incubations. That suggests that we have a metabolism issue that we have to deal with that probably would limit um, the ability of this drug to go forward until we've solved it. There's many ways to deal with this problem and those are the kinds of things that Margie's working on now in the lab. When we took um, this molecule, bromophycolide A, into the infected mouse model, so now we're looking with mice that have been infected with uh, malaria, we see that after a five-day period at a, f a you know, reasonable dosing regime um, for these kinds of experiments, we have about a 40% drop in the parasite load from um, the, the mouse during that time. That's despite the fact that we've got this metabolism issue that we haven't yet solved, right? So, so this is promising efficacy that we want to be able um, to optimize, um, and the first thing on our, on our plate right now is to deal with the metabolism issue. So I'm just going to wrap up here and try to bring it all together because I know I talked about a couple of uh, different aspects, um, even though the theme involving these compounds from seaweeds was held, but I, I hope that I've been able to convince you that um, natural products um, that have complex molecular structures are really important in nature. They do important things that protect organisms from each other, uh, allow them to fight out their battles, and, and to maintain dominance at, um, and uh, survival on, on, in environments like coral reefs. Uh, there's lots and lots of, of chemical variation um, among, I've just shown you the example of two closely related algal species. Uh, we've been working with several thousand extracts. We're finding new molecular structures from many hundreds of these. Well, that, that would be exciting. We know that we're finding it from many dozens of these. We think that there's that much chemical variation and new chemistry in many hundreds. So it's just a question of time for us to get um, to get to discover more of those those new types of mo molecular structures. A lot of these natural products uh, produce or contain carbon skeletons and structural motifs that are not seen elsewhere in the natural world and not seen in the synthetic world. So these um, these exhibit qualities that uh, that give us insights into how we can. Um, use pharmacological tools to treat disease and in themselves might be able to become new drugs. And so I hope that um, you've been able to be convinced that there's a lot of promise for these kinds of molecules in treatment of human disease for the, f for the future. So here are some of the people who've contributed to the work, um, so in many cases without the first letter of their last name. Um, the students whose work I've talked the most about um, were Paige and Amy, and I've also told you about Margie's recent work on the pharmacology. Other members of the group are shown here, and some of them are participating in very closely related projects and are also working on um, identifying other new molecules. Uh, we have lots of collaborators that are crucial to this work, and Facundo Fernandez's lab has been really essential uh, for the chemical ecology aspects. Um, on the Georgia Tech campus, we also collaborate with Stefan Franz's lab on synthesis, and his lab is working now on a total synthesis of the bromophycolide class of natural products. Um, the Hay Lab next door to us with Sebastian Engel is really key for developing these libraries of extracts and giving us insights into which ones we should tackle for our biomedical discoveries. And then we have a number of collaborators around the country and over in Fiji that help us um, achieve this work. And I thank you very much for coming today. And it looks like there is breakfast um, at the back. <laughs> How much is the airfare to Fiji and did your students pass the diving test? Um, airfare to Fiji is about $1,500 and yes, they passed the diving test. <laughs> ah, okay, scientific question. If you go to the structure of your, uh, of your uh, drug, what do you think will be the primary uh, metabolism? Uh, the next one. Aside for the drugs. Okay, well, I actually, if we can focus on this one because here's the natural product itself. Mm -hmm. So, um, we, from the work that Margie's done to look at which enzymes cause loss of bromophycolides, so we haven't been able to identify the structure of the metabolites yet, but based on where bromophycolides are lost in these in vivo assays, um, we think that there is some glucuronidation that's going on. That would likely happen at hydroxyl 
positions. So it could happen at this hydroxyl position, it could happen at that hydroxyl position. The other thing that could be happening with this molecule... Uh, but, but on the next slide, this, this hydroxyl group is blocked, right? It's protected with the uh, dye. Yeah, but so this is the, the semi-synthetic um, probe. So it has biological activity in, vi in vitro, right? And we don't see metabolism in vitro. We only see metabolism if we go to the whole animal model where you have the liver and the kidney or if you use these enzymes. So in vitro, where we have pretty decent biological activity for the probe and for all the natural products, that doesn't give us um, the information we need about the metabolism because those enzymes are largely not present in the in vitro assay. Do you use simple pH test or is it it should be pH sensitive. Um, it, sh it would be pH sensitive. So the most sensitive part of the molecule for pH would probably be the ester linkage. Okay? Um, it's not sensitive at physiological pH over a 48-hour period. So when we incubate, say, at 37 degrees in human blood for 48 hours, we see no loss of compound at all. Margie did that experiment. So it seems to be pretty stable, just under normal um, non-enzymatic conditions. Um, but yeah, we do have some, some vulnerable groups. So in a, in a synthetic um, plan, if we were going to make uh, analogs of this compound that were radically different, um, I would look at replacing the ester bond, um, and I would look at derivatizing the aromatic ring to prevent uh, potential for, you can get enzymes that will hydroxylate here, and then uh, create an epoxide, and then, and then open that up, and then add glucuronide. So I might try some kind of um, modification over there. Jim? I was wondering, uh, since these are targeted at fungal uh, parasites, what about the human uh, fungal parasites? Do they seem not to be active, or yeah. have, you, uh, have you scanned a lot of uh, species that are important for human disease? And if they're not active, uh, uh, what's your reason right. why they're effective with the algae and not with uh, yeah, I, I like that question a lot. So what we know is that the compounds have very decent potency against one particular marine fungus and not against another marine fungus um, that we've studied and not against the human pathogen Candida albicans. Um, that doesn't mean that there aren't other fungi that are susceptible. We haven't found them. So Dow Chemical would like us to send a sample so that they can test it against agricultural pest fungi, and we're planning to do that. So the mode of action against the one marine fungus that we know it's active against, we don't know yet. The heme detoxification is not an issue for marine fungi. There has to be another mode of action. That's actually something that Troy in my lab is interested in pursuing. Um, we can, this probe, um, we've got some of it left and we can easily make more and the same technology that was used to try to pull down proteins from the malaria parasite could be used to try to identify if the drug is binding to a protein in the fungus. So that is something that I think we, I would be very interested to know the answer to as Have well. Have you looked at uh, inhibition of maybe lipid, uh, membrane lipid biosynthesis or something? No, we haven't, no. Um, we haven't done any kinds of targeted screens like that. Uh, that would be something that I that would be interested in doing as well. Don? Um, have you looked at mixtures of these compounds instead of just purifying? So in terms of their biological activities? Right. Not with the not in the malaria side. On the um, on the chemical defense side, yes, they seem to act additively more or less. There's not really good evidence that they work synergistically. So synergistically would be if you know, the sum of, was more than what you'd expect, right? And when we deal with the crude extracts that contain all the compounds at once, we have nice antifungal potent activity, um, but you can account for that basically by the sum of each of the molecules that are present. So there's not um, evidence that there's something other than additive. Uh, that suggests that the compounds might all be acting by the same mode of action, just to varying extents, because they don't all have the same IC50 against the fungus. Natural concentration? Yeah. It's kind of a tricky thing, isn't it? Um, with the, it's not distributed evenly through the cell. Right. So how do you actually calculate that? Okay. So the natural whole tissue concentrations is done in the kind of crude way that you would, um, where would be the best way to do that? Maybe here. Um, the, the bulk concentrations are done by taking multiple small snippets of alga, generating a crude extract from it and, you, and quantifying by LCMS. That's bulk tissue concentration. To get the natural concentrations here, we actually took um, a piece of clean alga that had no um, grit on it. 
We deposited the molecules onto the surface as best we could as a thin film at varying concentrations. So Amy did this work and we actually measured um, a dose response curve of deposits. So we basically created a spiked sample where we measured a dose response curve for known concentrations of compound deposit on the surface and then we compared the intensity from those, that dose response curve with the intensity we measured here in various different spots. So the natural concentration on the surface from many different samples averaged out at I believe 36 picomoles per millimeter squared. Okay, and the IC50 on the surface, which we are also able to do, so you can do an IC50 experiment, you can do a dose response curve for the potency by coating the compound onto an auger surface and then inoculating with a fungus, no problem. The IC50 on the surface was about half of what we measured. So on the surface, the concentration seems to be about double what is needed to, con to um, uh, minimize growth by 50%. So, Facundo was a little bit hesitant about that. He, he is very concerned about matrix effects and all those things, so we are calling it sort of a semi-quantitative approach, but it was the best we could do. Can you give us a sense of the biogeographic distribution of the bromophagolins? Um, yes, and I don't, didn't bring that slide. Okay, so within Fiji, this, um, these two species of algae, we have now collected at about 20 different sites, and we um, find both of those species um, all over the place and only in one site that we know of have we found them side by side on the same reef. The, however, the taxonomy books report this species both, well, the, the, the one that makes the bromophycolides as being found throughout the South Pacific tropical region. However, um, it doesn't seem to be very common because chemists who've been um, searching the world for unusual organisms so that they could find these new compounds never found it until we found it in 2005 and people have been trying harder than that for a long time. So I don't think that it's um, very commonly abundant, but the Calophycus serratus, the bromophycoli producing species, is thought to be found in places like the Philippines, and in other parts of the South Pacific, not just Fiji. So, so do you think that that species has acquired a new enzyme function? I mean, if you, if you go back in its genealogy of the... the right. So, um, there, this family of algae, so if I, what would be the best place to look at this? Um, the, the family to which these species belong, so first of all, the family doesn't have a lot of species in it. The family to which this, these two species belong, um, In terms of their secondary metabolism, enzymes are not at all known, but when we've started now working with algae that are from that same class, is that right, Troy? We're starting, or... Well, nails? Yeah, the class. We're finding this kind of chemistry again and again. So Margie recently has worked with another member of that class. It seems from the 18S ribosomal RNA sequence to be an unnamed species of red alga and it's also producing molecules that have the same C20 terpenoid C7 benzoate functionality but not linked together in the same way. So where they probably diverge is in how they deal with the cyclization issues. That would be my guess. They all have the capacity to make these C20 fragments, which is not surprising. I think all algae actually have that capacity. And the C7 is a primary metabolite building block that you get from, it's part of amino acid biosynthesis. So it's bringing these things together and making rings out of them that is probably where they diverge enzymatically, but we don't know. That's just speculation. <coughs> All right, I think that it's 9.30, which I probably why everyone's gone quiet. So thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it very much. <laughs>